Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jenny McFarland. I am the bird conservation biologist for the Tucson Audubon Society and the coordinator of the Elegant Trogon Survey. And this is the uh, volunteer info, you know, surveyor info meeting for the 2023 Elegant Trogon Surveys of the Huachuca Mountains and the Chiricahua Mountains. And this is, um, let me just make a note of that, Michelle. Okay. This is uh, an info meeting for both the Huachucas and Chiricahuas. This is the last sort of segment of elegant trogon surveys that we do for Southeast Arizona for the Arizona Important Bird Areas Program. And we do five, five throughout the whole time. Um, throughout May, we do five total mountain ranges, five different important bird areas. And this is over three weekends, and this is the last weekend. So this is gonna be the Huachuca Mountains Survey and the Chiricahua Mountains Survey. I'm going to go ahead and change, share my screen. Here we go. Okay. So I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about elegant trogons and uh, sort of what's what's going on with them, right? This is a famous bird of Southeast Arizona, incredibly desirable bird, one that people really want to see. And uh, it's it's one that really gets a lot of attention. So it's one that people will travel here, for, travel here for and kind of a famous bird of the region. But let's talk a little bit about them. So here they are. They're really cool looking birds. And they're also, there's one in my background. The male gets a lot of attention. He's a very, uh, it's a very handsome bird. He's got this really bright sort of cherry red belly with a white kind of collar band on the upper chest green on the head and on the back the green on these birds is pretty iridescent the red no the red's matte but the the green is it's really when it catches the light it's it's very very beautiful they're really really stunning birds and um and they have this long tail real long tail that and this really can can show up quite well when you see them perched is that long real kind of rectangular tail shape is a big thing with these birds now they're very brightly colored the males are and you'd think wow, I'll be able to spot this bird. He's so brightly colored. If he was anywhere near me, I would see him. But they're really, really good at hiding. And they really will tuck into vegetation. They'll often turn a green back towards you in a, in a tree. So they actually hide quite well. And then the females are uh, differently colored. So here's a female here in the center. They're shades of, of brown, you know, sort of tan. And they're the same size and shape as the male. And they have that same long square tail, but they have a sort of a, a, a kind of a grayish chest where they still have a little white collar, but then sort of a brown head with a white teardrop mark coming down from the eye. And they do have pink on the belly. I did see some females this last weekend uh, on the Santa Rita's and Patagonia survey. And the pink really does pop when they, when they flip by, when they fly by that kind of rosy pink. And then their backs look a little different too so let's see here there's a juvenile here's a good here's a nice one of a female from behind so they have a brown back not green there's really no green on these female trogons they have the brown back and they have this lovely coppery back of the tail which is sort of the old name for these trogons was coppery tailed trogon and which is why they have that so they have this lovely copper on the back of the tail brown back just really pretty cool and we see females far less frequently than males they're a little more shy so if you do see a female that's pretty great because I hard, I always see a couple a year and then I see many more males than females. The females do call, but not nearly as much as the males and in a much deeper tone of voice. So this is a juvenile, this one right here. So this is a young trogon, like a, like a fledgling, maybe a little bit older fledgling, but definitely born. This is a hatch year bird born this year. And it looks a bit like a female in the sense that it doesn't have any red. This is obviously a young male. He's getting some green coming in, but it's these spots on the wing that really give them away as a young bird. So we see a trogon with a little teardrop mark, like a female, um, maybe some brown. If it was a young female, it wouldn't have any green on the back, but they have these spots on the secondaries of the wing, sort of like the shoulder part of the wing. That's a real good indicator that you have a young one. The reason I mentioned that is I have had reports from people in the Chiricahuas that they have, they had a, at least one pair nesting much earlier than usual, where they were feeding babies like a week and a half ago. So that's quite early. Usually in, we do these surveys in May, 
because that's when the trogons are usually still sorting themselves out, usually on territory, often paired up, maybe maybe on eggs, but usually most of them aren't quite yet. So maybe it's a good time to do these surveys because they're on territory. The males are being really loud and responsive to playback and also just calling because they hear each other calling. So just sort of up for it, easier to survey because they're making more noise and just being more visible, but usually not quite nesting. So then I don't worry so much about us bothering the birds during a critical sort of nesting phase because they're usually not quite nesting yet. But at least one pair in the Chiricahua seems real ahead of schedule, which is interesting to me because we did have quite a lot of winter rain and some unusual spring rain. So it's not that surprising that some of these birds may have started early. So I mentioned that because it is possible, probably more possible this year than usual to see fledglings if we had a pair nesting early. So that's why I really want to point out what these fledglings look like. These, these young birds, they do leave the nest pretty quick as fledglings and hang around with their parents for a while learning how to be trogons. But um, these males are absolutely stunningly beautiful, iconic birds, but still quite good at hiding. So this is a page from Cornell, the Cornell Lab All About Birds, a page on trogons. I do link to this on this info page about the trogon surveys on our Arizona IBA website. And it's sort of down here where I have here, um, you know, identification tips and how to find trogon from Cornell can be found here. So that's what I'm looking at is this page here. So you can find that link yourself if you'd like to look at this in more detail. But it's really a very good page talking about trogons and that especially how things like their shape can really help you identify them because they really do have a shape unlike anything else out there in the sky islands where they have this kind of almost hunched over appearance when they're like in the photo behind me on my on my zoom screen they really do have sort of this like this their back kind of sticks out a little bit it's the way they sit they have a strange way of sitting and they also do this very upright posture frequently when they'll perch on a branch where they're really sitting real straight up with that tail coming straight down and then um so they often sit like that they're just kind of sitting straight up, but they're also very, very still. And one of the things that this page talks about that's really very good is their behavior. So they eat mostly insects. That's the thing with them too. These are cavity nesting birds, insect eating birds, getting a lot of large bodied insects. I saw one last weekend just absolutely annihilating a giant caterpillar, just banging it on a branch before it ate it. So they eat a lot of insects, uh, like things like stick bugs, grasshoppers, katydids, uh, big caterpillars. They seem to really, really like those even up to like lizards. I've seen photos of them with lizards in their bill. And they do this behavior of hunting for insects where they will watch motionless. So they're really good at sitting really still, probably for their hunting, but also to avoid humans and predators. But they will sort of be real still for a while and then they'll kind of burst into flight and catch something. And they also eat a lot of fruit too, especially in the winter. So they also like pyracantha, especially if you're looking for them. We have those few that stay over for the winter you get um, some going after fruit, but uh, they do like fruit, but they, they also have this thing I've noticed with them, which I haven't read any, anyone talk about this, but when they fly, you would think a bird of this size, I mean, there's large as like a Mexican jay. They're quite a large bird. You would think that when they fly by, you would hear wing noise. You'd hear, you know, the sound of, of wind of wings and you really don't, they're really pretty quiet flyers, but luckily for us and for our survey, they're pretty noisy. So um, this, this, this page does have a good video, but I'm going to do it second because it's not the most common call you're going to hear. It's a good call and we're going to play it, but I want to first go back to my, my main page here. So this is my page on the, the website of Arizona Important Bird Areas Program. That's the program that I run these surveys for and through. This is a kind of like a flagship survey of this larger program, the IBA program. And it's really great because we do five different IBAs. It's, it's a really popular survey. People really like it. It's a lot of volunteer participation. It's probably one of our most involved and sort of extensive survey. Every year I have a hundred or more people who participate. So it's really quite a, quite a really cool effort with a lot of people involved. Um, so on this info page, I always have info, sort of a background thing about what these survey, why they're important and why they're special, then the different dates, and then some survey or resources. So these are resources for you guys. And these are general resources for trogon surveys in general. And then I have specific pages for each survey, which we'll talk about a little later. But so I have a few things here. One is this link here to a PDF scan. And this is from a book that was written by Rick Taylor that's currently out of print. So which is why, and Rick generously said we could go ahead and share a scan of this book. You occasionally see it for sale. It's that little red book of trogons of Arizona. Do I have it right here? I do. 
So this book here, Trogons of Arizona, is what this is from. It's kind of a cool book. You occasionally see it at like a, a birding used book sale. It's a pretty cool book. It talks about everything Rick learned about Trogons a long time ago in the 70s. But this, this, these few pages in particular are the ones we scanned for to share if you're interested. And it just talks about the different sorts of calls that Trogons make and what Rick thought these different calls meant in terms of their behavior because he spent a lot of time watching them. So that's what that is. They've got this, this nice little um, uh, scan from the book of that. Or if you get a chance to buy the book, it is pretty good. But what that basically is talking about is these three main types of calls. So I'm going to play them right now. And this, so this first one is the main sort of male territorial singing call. We call it the coink call, or sometimes people will call it like the, the ca call. But this is the loudest call, kind of the iconic call. Mexican J2 making noise. Okay, so it goes a bit longer, and these are all MP3s from AZFO. You're welcome to right click on these and save link as to download these if you would like, but these are uh, uh, open use. You can use these from AZFO. You can download them. So that's the main call. So they do this sort of really loud barking call. It carries pretty far. The males do this sort of just a sort of territory advertising. They're telling other Trogon males, this is my territory, you know, stay out of it. It could also be an invitation to females if they don't have a pair yet. If he doesn't have a, a female yet, say, you know, come check out my territory. I'm looking for a mate. So it's very much sort of when we think of songbirds like singing, males singing. That's what this calls for. They do this other call too that you'll sometimes hear. Okay. So that call we call the, uh, oh, shoot. Didn't mean to close that. That's the one we we call the um the, the cow call. I've also called it the cha-cha call. It's much, much quieter. If you hear this cha 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 kind of call, they're usually much closer than you think. It's not a very loud call. So if you're hearing it, the birds are relatively close to you. And this seems more of a contact call. So this is a communication call between two trogons. I have seen males do this call to each other, and it almost seems like uh, kind of earlier in the season, usually, where they're trying to discuss a boundary or what's going on. So I have heard this this cow or this cha cha call when they're sort of talking among themselves. It's almost always used between a pair. So when you hear this, you very likely have a pair of trogons because it's, it's a call they'll do to each other, the male towards the female especially. So it's like a contact call. And then there's this wiki ki 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 call, which uh, is interpreted often as an alarm call. So let's listen to that. Okay, so that's considered an alarm call. And when you when I've heard them do it like this, where it does sound incredibly alarmed, and there's two of them doing it, and they're really emphatic in that sound, this is them being quite alarmed. So you're probably near a nest. So it's best if you hear this to to back away so they calm down a little bit and then maybe try to get a sense when they're when they're sort of more chilled out. If you can find the nest, that's great. We always like that information. But if you're hearing this, especially if you're hearing two trogons, you know you got a pair. They're probably nesting. That's certainly enough for the data. So you don't have to get any closer or stress them out or anything. But if you'd like to sort of carefully try to get it, maybe from a distance, try to see where their nest is, that's also totally fine. But don't feel like you need to if you don't want to bother these birds. But And it's funny, too. We, we consider this an alarm call. But I have heard them do the same call in the winter when you have the, the very small percentage of them that stay in Arizona for the winter, most of them go back to Mexico, but they do do this sort of wee kee 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 call in the winter as well, but it doesn't sound as alarmed. It doesn't sound as emphatic. And I don't think it's always an alarm call, but when you hear it in the spring and when they're sounding quite alarmed and they really do, they have this sort of, you know, tone of, of, of emphaticness and they're really quite alarmed. Definitely back off, let them calm down before, you know, getting any closer because they they're quite they're quite upset. All right, so back to this um, All About Birds page. They have this cool video of a trogon preening, and he's doing the cha-cha-cha call. So let's listen to that. This is like the contact call.
it's a pretty relaxed bird. He's just sort of hanging out. He's preening. He's he's doing this contact call. He's probably just telling his mate, I'm here. It's like when warblers sort of tick at each other and saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here kind of thing. So I think this is a very, it's a very intimate kind of call. And it usually means you have a pair. So if you hear that, whenever I hear that on a survey, I do interpret it as a pair in my data sheet. Even if I don't see the other bird, even if I don't see either trogon, if you're sure it's trogon, it's doing that call because they often will coink. And then when you get closer and they then will do the cha-cha-cha, almost like assuring the female where, where they are and that they're there. So you often hear that you occasionally hear females do it back. I've even heard females do sort of a coink, but their voices are like a whole octave lower than the males. They're like a little baritone, much lower voice. And they don't call nearly as many times or nearly as often. So if you hear sort of a, a male doing his regular quink, 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 and then you hear sort of a response that's lower pitched, that's almost certainly a female. All right. So that's a little bit about trogons. So for the survey itself, I do have this main page with a lot of information about the, the trogons themselves, such as what we were just looking at, a link to that Cornell page about how to identify them. Uh, the three sort of main calls. Also, a lot of the apps on your phone, if you have a bird ID sort of field guide app, they have quite good recordings as well of these different calls. And there's, there's sort of different sort of versions that the males do of their loud sort of coink, coink. I've heard coink, coink. And there's the course, so kind of a like, ka, ka, ka. They're just sort of like kind of alternate versions of very, very similar type loud emphatic call. So like the, the Merlin app from Cornell is free that you can download onto your phone and has uh, good audio files too of these birds or like the Sibley one also has very good audio files. But so there's some information there. And then I have a note about the surveys. And this is something I'm trying to do more and more, make sure people are, are aware of this when they even sign up for the survey. And then I have a short little video on what to expect for an elegant trogon survey. If you have not done a survey before, you should definitely take a look at this because it does talk about a little bit of what to expect for the day. For instance, if you're coming from Tucson and we're doing, you're doing a Sierra Vista you know, a Wachuca Mountains survey that's near Sierra Vista, quite a long drive. These surveys do start at 6 a.m. So that's sort of information that's, I think, really uh, important for people to know up front. I also, um, on this page, this is where I also put links to sort of sub pages to all the results for the past several years. So starting in 2017, I started doing this. So then later on, later this summer, there will be a new page added here for the 2023 results. So I also, I do sort of a write out of the results as well as an interactive map. Now, all that information will be sent to you directly as someone who's helping with these surveys. But this is if, if anyone in the general public's interested, this is always available online, the data for the last surveys. OK, so let's talk a little bit about um, Wachukas. So the Wachuca Mountains is a really cool mountain range. It's, it's big. It's one of the biggest sky islands, and it is certainly the highest count every year for elegant trogons. It is a big mountain range. It's got a lot of really good canyons for them. And we usually get somewhere in the 50 range for elegant trogons in the Wachukas. It is the biggest of the ranges. So, and just has a lot of excellent habitat. So what I have here on this page specifically for the Wachukas are some resources here. I do have the protocol link. I have a data form link, and then which we'll look at. I also have a pullout here that I scanned from Tucson Audubon's book, Finding Birds in Southeast Arizona. This is the section on Wachuca Mountains. And if you're totally unfamiliar for this region, I would definitely suggest you take a look at this link because it does have some nice sort of general background information about um, the Huachuca Mountains area. So if you're if you're totally new to this area, that's a nice thing to sort of take a look at that gives sort of general information. I also have a really good map here of the Huachuca Mountains. So if you're unfamiliar with the Huachucas and you're sort of assigned a trail on my on my uh, page. Uh, you know, a team on a trail or something, and you're not super familiar with the uh, Wachukas, this is a good thing to look at. It's actually a really nice map that we got special permission to use uh, a scan of, since Rick is friends with the person who did it. And it's a really good map. And, and we actually, I think we, I think we sell this in our nature shop too. So if you like the map, you can buy it, but it's this really good map that shows um, the different trails throughout the Wachuca. So I have really nice scanned version of that map that you can take a look at. It's sort of the north portion and the south portion. Split in half was too big for one big scan. Um, and then I also have a link to enter your online results or to enter your results online. So that's something too that you'll get, you know, a reminder about specifically from me after the survey. But if you can't find that link from an email on where to enter your online, to enter your data online, that is where it is. And then of course I have here the, uh, 
this is the link to the video meeting for last year. And right directly after our meeting ends today, I will upload our new meeting and that will go on this webpage as well, as well as the link sent out to everybody. So I am going to share all these links with you guys directly, but I also want to show that they're here and you can access them anytime from this webpage if you would like. So I also have um, a map, my own sort of custom map that we've made using Google My Maps of the, the Wachukas and the different routes, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So you can kind of look at it here or you can view it full page, which we'll do in a moment. But I want to talk about the protocol real quick. So these documents here, so you click on this link and it goes to a PDF of the protocol. And this is a written out page. You don't need to print this out or anything, but if you've never done these surveys before, it's definitely a good idea to read through this because it talks a little bit about the different calls and what they mean and what these surveys are about and what's going on. But um, the main gist is that these surveys start at 6 a.m. You certainly can start sooner if you would like. Trogons are most vocal early in the morning. They make most of their noise and they're most active very early. So if you live in the area and you want to start at 530, I highly encourage that sort of thing because they really do make a lot more noise earlier. But we also don't want to make this too crazy for people. So that's why we sort of have our official start at 6 a.m. That's not like a super hard 6 a.m. If something's happening and you don't start till like a few minutes after six, that's totally fine. But the, the general idea is to start at 6 a.m., move through your assigned territory, your assigned route, looking and listening for trogons. You can do playback where it's permissible. There are a few locations that do not permit playback, the sound of, you know, playing bird sounds to try to get a response. There's some places that don't allow it. I'm pretty sure the fort prefers you not do it. And also South Fork of the Chiricahuas, uh, the Coronado National Forest has a prohibition and places like Madera Canyon too, they don't allow it in the Santa Rita's. So unless there's a prohibition, we totally encourage and allow people to uh, play playback. That means if you thought you heard something, you're like, gosh, this is a good piece of territory. How come no trogons are calling? You can play a little bit of Trogon, that coin coin call, the sort of the mail, the standard mail call works real well for this and to try to elicit a response. We do not sort of lay, we don't like dictate how frequently you do it or, you know, how many certain amounts of distance you do it. It's sort of, it's very free form and up to your best judgment. And also, you know, if it's permissible to do it in that area. So if this can work really well, if you thought you heard something, but you're not sure, or you're, you're hearing like a weird sound, you're not sure if it's Trogon, because if you play it, that often gets them to respond. Or if you're like, gosh, this looks like a good area. And this can be especially useful, I find, at confluences. So if you're in a drainage and there's another drainage coming in from the side, that's what's known as a confluence. So it's two drainages meeting. And these are often excellent places for Trogons. They do seem to really key in on confluences. So I will sometimes play if I'm in an area where it's allowed, which I will be, I'll be on the south side of the Wachukas where it's not on the fort or anything. Um, I'll play sort of up that side drainage. And sometimes you get a response up the side drainage. You don't have to go up there or anything, but you can just document that you heard one up that side drainage. So that is a really good use of playback. So the protocol talks about this and that you can do playback and all that. And then it also um, says where to do your data entry and all this stuff. So this is a real basic overview of the of the of the methodology, but the basic idea is to move through your area starting around 6 a.m. or earlier. And that we usually, so we have here at the end time is 11 a.m. You don't have to go to 11. If you feel like you've covered your route really well and you've gone, you know, you feel like you have a really good sense and it's only like 10 a.m. and you started early or something, that's totally fine. You don't have to go to 11, but you certainly can. Um, I don't need people to go later than 11. If you're having a great time and you want to go further, you're enjoying your birding day, uh, that's also totally fine. You don't have to cut off at 11, but that's sort of a general good end time. But if you end a little earlier, a little later, that's also fine. So these are really kind of freeform surveys because they're sort of, because they're census surveys. And that's the idea that we're sort of just looking, trying to document all the trogons and where they are. So I also want to talk about the data form. Now I have an actual data form here that you can print out and use in the field. You certainly don't have to. If you just look closely at this data form and then uh, make sure you have all the information it's asking for, like written down in a notebook or something, that will also work because you're doing your data entry yourself onto, um, you know, an online Google Forms sort of survey, like a, it's a, you know, an online survey where you're entering your data because you're entering your own data. If you can just put this in a notebook or a piece of paper, that works is works fine for me. Okay. So but what I do need to know is the name of your territory, the date, your contact information. But also anytime you detect a trogon, what we really need to know 
is on your route is the is the time that the detection happened. And that can be a range of time too. It can be like, you know, from, from 6.55 to 7.15. You know, as long as you were observing them, sort of the time that you were observing them, the number and sex of the trogons, if you know, okay? So you can be a pair, you can say, oh, one pair, or like I saw a male or one unknown sex. Or if he's like, well, he's doing the coin, the trogon's doing the coin, coin, coin call, that'll be a male, you know? Um, and then we need coordinates. Okay, so I need a location on these birds and because we do map the results at the end. And I, it, it's pretty difficult to do that without coordinates. Now, some people like to just say, okay, it was half a mile from the trailhead. We can certainly use that to get an approximate location, but coordinates are best. So they don't have, they can be decimal degrees or which is kind of standard on Google Maps. And I will also send out a link to everyone too. I have a little page written up of how to use GPS on your phone uh, or how to use like a Garmin GPS. These apps are so good now. There's a lot of free GPS apps that you can put right on your smartphone that really do very well at telling you your coordinates. It's it's pretty great how much phones have helped with this. They can also be in UTMs, which is like the um, kind of the metric version of coordinates. They're totally uh, convertible between the two. But I do need coordinates on where you had trog where you had a trogon. Every time you have a trogon, I need coordinates. And then any sort of notes, any behavior, if you see them hunting or you see them hanging out together, any sort of behavior. Like I'll have some, like I'll often record things like, you know, you know, 701, you know, I have it was one male, I'll have the coordinates, and that's something like he flew off to the south or something like that. Okay. So um it's definitely, this is all you really need is to document these items. So you, you're welcome to print out the data form. I mean, I do. It's a nice little data form. Or you can just keep track on, um, you know, another piece of paper. So another thing we do is we do try to, if you're able to, we try to keep track of the other bird species that you detect throughout the morning. So this is the form, the back of the form, the sort of page two of the form is a checklist. More and more people are just using eBird for this. And that's what I do now. Just do an eBird list throughout the course of the morning. And then you don't even have to worry about doing this checklist. So if you do an eBird list, the online data entry form does include um, a place for you to, to paste in that eBird checklist link, as well as information on, um, if you share it with AZIBA survey, eBird account, that's a username for an eBird account. If you share it with us, that checklist comes to us. So that's, eBird has made this a lot easier. <laughs> Um, okay, so then I do have a map of the different routes here. So when that uh, page goes out later today, it's a link going to be an, to an online document. When that page goes out today of where people are assigned, this is the map it will be referencing. So each of these routes has a name. You can zoom in and see them. Now, these, these lines are pretty approximate but they're, they're, they're close. Okay. So that you don't have to like, if the trail goes a little bit east or west of the line or something uh, to stick with the trail for sure. But I did try to make these as accurate as possible. And we do change, we do sort of update them, modify them, improve them year by year as I get feedback from people. But you can see some of these more major canyons are divided into multiple routes. So like here's Ramsey from Sierra Vista. I have a lower Ramsey section with a specific start and end. This is lower Ramsey. I have a middle Ramsey because it's just this canyon is just too much for any one team to do in the morning in, in a morning, the middle Ramsey section and then an upper Ramsey section. So a lot of these drainages are divided into sections and many of the routes are from the Sierra Vista side. Sort of the sort of northeast side. So like Garden Canyon splits into several routes, you know, McClure goes off to the side. Uh, two of the our major canyon complexes, Wachuca Canyon and Garden Canyon, are both on the fort, on Fort Wachuca. If you end up assigned to one of those, now some people indicated to me in the in the sign up form that they were happy to go on the fort, you know, would like to go on the fort or, or could, you know, had to have a pass. If you're a local person, if you're a servant heirs, if Southern Arizona resident, uh, when they give you a Fort Wachuca pass, it is good for a year. You know, it can be, it's some, it depends on what mood they're in, but it's often good for a year. Sometimes they're good for just a month. It depends on what's going on like nationally, but, but recently they've been giving them out for a, a year long pass. So I have one all ready to go. Many, many birders do. People who bird in this area often already have a Fort Huachuca pass. If you get assigned to a Fort Huachuca route, and I will also reach out to all, anyone I assigned to Fort Huachuca specifically about this too. If you're assigned to one of these routes and you can't go onto the fort, we'll just switch you to a different route. Okay. I also will have a link of information about how to get a pass because it's free. It doesn't cost anything. It does take a little effort. You have to go there 
and the facility where they issue the passes is open 24 hours. So you can conceivably do it coming in before the survey, do it at like, you know, 5 a.m. You can do that. They are open. And that early, there's usually not a wait, but um, but many people sort of do it ahead of time, day before type thing. Um, but it's worth having and it's good for a year and it gets you into some really good birding habitat. Fort Huachuca is really nice. Okay, so that's the map for that. And then I also have uh, areas on the sort of Southwest side of the mountain of the Huachuca. And this is where I will be. This is a really interesting area where we have these other kind of canyons on the Mexico side of, um, not not in Mexico, but you know, close to the Southern side of the Huachucas and really good areas. So like, here's Oversight, yeah, Ida, Ida and Oversight. These are really nice canyons where we do get a lot of trogons. So Bear Canyon, uh, I split Bear and it gets split into two. And then I have Wakefield and I have Lone Mountain, Lower Bear and Upper Bear. So really good, really good spots. And this is the area where you come over the Coronado Pass to get back to the Sierra Vista side. So Wachukas is a big range. It's a big range. We do a lot of routes. Uh, this is the one I always need the most people for. And I'm pretty pleased to see how many people signed up for this, this uh, particular survey because it does take quite a lot to do the Wachukas. And then I have, um, I have a few routes too that we do around Parker Canyon Lake. I, I saw at least one person indicated they like to do this area. This is probably the area that's relatively, if you live in Patagonia or Sonoida, this is the closest area to you. It's also kind of for Tucson, it can be kind of a good option too, if you're coming from Tucson. And these are canyons that you wouldn't think of as being good for trogons. But in 2015 and 2016, we did yellow bill cuckoo surveys in this area. And we had a lot of trogons on those surveys in July and August. So we've searched them ever since for the trogon survey. And some years we get several trogons in here. Some years we get a lot, some years we get fewer. It just really depends. It's really interesting. Some years we get a lot. I feel like the count's going to be good this year in terms of, this is just my, my gut guess at the moment. I think we're going to have quite a lot of um, trogons this year uh, back on the upswing. Now that that drought from 2020 to 2021, June to June of 2020, 2021, that really severe drought. I think the, the habitat is, is recovering now that we've had two good monsoons in a row. So I think that's I wouldn't be surprised at all if we get trogons around Parker Canyon Lake this year. So anyway, so those are sort of the three main areas of the Huachucas. It's so big <laughs> that we have to have clusters of areas. It's a really big range. So yeah, we'll be sending out specific information to everyone who signed up for the Huachucas on what route you're on, and then a lot of information about um, the Huachucas themselves, because they're a really cool range. All right, so then the Chiricahua survey, this is kind of the original survey. So this is the one that Rick started many years ago, I think like in the 80s, Rick started surveying Chiricahuas. And it still has a lot of people who help with the survey who live in Portal who have been helping all these years. So it has a lot of people who are very dedicated and still help with the survey, which is just so fun. Uh, I really love that about the, the Chiricahuas survey. But this is in a very similar way set up where I have the directions and protocol link here on this specific page for the Chiricahua survey so again it opens a pdf oh come on you can do it internet what is wrong with that Let me try that again directions and protocol it's not working i will fix it Jeez, what's wrong with that just check this before the meeting and it was fine okay so uh, directions to protocol the main difference with the shirakawa from the other surveys is because south fork is such a dense habitat area i have a lot of routes within south fork so this is more of a sitting protocol. If you're doing a South Fork sort of Cave Creek complex, which is sort of the main famous birding area of, of the Chiricahuas, where these protocols are more about sort of staying in your territory and especially staying towards the center of your territory and, and moving a little bit, roaming up and down a little bit, but especially at the beginning, getting to your territory, staying in place and keeping track of when you hear trogons, whether they're up canyon or down canyon from your position. And this is the way Rick's always done these surveys. So it's how we continue to do them. And for these, the dense part of the surveying, I have a few routes that are more canyony areas away from the Cape Creek complex. And those are more like the Huachuca surveys where you just spend your morning moving through your territory, looking for trogons. And I have no problem with people roaming a bit through their habits, their, their route in the morning, but you really want to be really paying close attention to if the trogons 
are up, you know, up canyon from you, down canyon from you and, and moving. Because we get this a lot in South Fork where you can look at the data forms and you can see just from the times and directions that people record the trogon moving, a trogon moving through multiple people's territories and moving back down. They do do this, especially if they're impaired, they'll sort of patrol the canyon. And it's important to keep track of when and where. And that's why this data form temporarily unavailable. What is wrong with my hoster? Okay, we'll figure that out. If not, if, if there's an issue here still, when I send the email, I'll send just direct PDFs attached to the email. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll be sending team assignments out later today. I also have a few links here to, to maps and things. So I have here sort of the traditional map of South Fork. This is an old school drawn out map that you might be familiar with. Is this going to work? Okay. Looks like it's going to work. Just taking a second. So this is the old school map. So you can see here, this is a kind of old fashioned topo map, but here's South Fork going down this way and then North Fork of Cave Creek this way. So I have some of these, oh, I have some of these map features here. And uh, I also have a more modern topo map of the Shirakawas. And this one looks like sort of like the Wachukas one where it's a more modern map. And then I have here again, I scanned the section of Southeast Arizona's, uh, Finding Birds of Southeast Arizona, Tucson Audubon's book on birding of Southeast Arizona, the section on the Chiricahuas. Because if you're not familiar with this area, if you haven't been out here, it's worth looking through because there's a few things to note. Also just like fun things, the fact that you can get cool birds at the top of the Chiricahuas, et cetera, that are like kind of too high for trogons. But a really important thing to keep in mind with Chiricahuas is that this area is not near any major towns. You need to come in with gas. There is not a gas station in Portal. You need to come in with, you know, pretty close to a full tank of gas. To, to make sure you can come in fully and then leave fully towards, um, you know, away from portal because there is no gas stations in portal. That's a really important thing to keep in mind. Uh, I also have the link here for the, the video, which I will update with the new video when this is uploaded. And then I have territory map. What internet am I on? Hang on. I'm going to switch internet. So maybe that will help. Okay. All right. Hopefully that will help. And hopefully everything is still rolling. Okay. Um, so I have my Chiricahua's map here. And this really focuses. You can see how densely I have small territories that are very densely packed into the Cave Creek complex. So there's the town of Portal down up here. This is on the east side of the Chiricahua, so on the New Mexico side of the Chiricahua. The real famous part of the, the birding area for the Chiricahua. And I have multiple little territories, and this is why we do sort of a stay in your territory, especially for a few hours, sit in the middle of your territory, you know, stay put and record trogons as you detect them. And then a little later in the morning, you're welcome to go up and down your territory as much as you'd like. So for the first few hours, starting at six, we do like people in the, who are in these these uh, Cave Creek area to stay put and keep track of trogons because that really helps us look at the data later. But I have a few areas that are more like traditional canyons, and those are here on like the west side. So I have like a team doing Rucker. Uh, we'll probably have a team, depending on how many people sign up, we'll probably have a team on the west side doing like Turkey Creek. This is some areas we sometimes survey, especially if people have reported trogons on eBird in these areas you know, Pinery Canyon in the north. So these are more just like regular canyon surveys, but the vast majority of the trogons we find in the Chiricahuas are here in the famous Cave Creek complex where South Fork, this is South Fork here, is located. So we put a lot of territories in here. Okay, so the Chiricahuas, the Chiricahuas, and we go, all right. So another thing I want to touch on is a new, and this will be explained fully in the email that I'm going to send to everybody. Last year, I added a new option for using a map in the field. So when you are using these Google maps, so all these maps I linked to on the, the website here, these are all um, using Google My Maps. So this is Google Maps, and you can view these on your smartphone, which works really well in places where you have signal, <laughs> where you have phone signal, works really, really well. It works less well in areas where you don't have strong phone signal or sort of any sort of phone signal. That doesn't happen that much in the Wachukas. The Wachukas tend to have relatively good phone signal, although on the, the Southwest side, it can be spotty, but it gets better and better in the Wachukas over time. And it still can be very poor in the Chiricahuas. And I did come up with a new way for people to use maps. If you would like, this is entirely optional 
but I developed this last year. And for those who want it, who are into it, I do have the Avenza option available. So if you're not familiar with Avenza, it's a, it's an app, it's a free app that you can put on your phone, on your smartphone, and it lets you access, um, it lets you access maps that are PDFs. Okay. So I've created PDF geo-referenced PDF maps of um, these areas of the Huachucas and of the Chiricahuas with our little drawn out routes on there. Okay. These are custom maps that I made and you can download them onto your phone and view them in the Avenza map if you would like. So what this means is that that background that you're looking at, the topo background, and then the little routes drawn on there will not disappear if you don't have signal because they're downloaded. They're pre-downloaded to your phone is the idea. And then because smartphones have satellite capability, they know where they're located. So you're the little blue dot on this background map that doesn't disappear. So that's what makes it different from Google Maps is Google Maps is sort of keeping that background map, you know, updated there through um, sort of signal. Now you can download a map, but that does show you the topo, but it doesn't show you the custom lines that we added to that map. Those can disappear without signal sometimes. So events is another option that lets you use this um, sort of offline almost, kind of an offline map option. So I created maps. They're here. I'm going to share this link with everybody. They're here in this online Google folder. You can download them. I have Chiricahua's maps. I have a portal zoom, a zoom into portal, as well as a... Um, a portal pullout or sort of all of the Chiricahuas. And then I have a Huachuca small and full size. So this is a larger file. It's the same map, but one's a really big file and one's a smaller file, a more compressed file. But I wanted to leave that up to you with choices. So you can download those maps onto your phone and then use Avenza, which this write-up I did explains how to use Avenza. It's a really useful app and you can, it has other maps you can download in it from within Avenza for free, like sort of those USGS topo map quads. It's a it's an app. If you do a lot of hiking and stuff, I do think it's an app worth getting, and it's free. And you can, because you might find other uses for it in your birding life, because you can sort of download free maps that they have a little free. They have a little store of maps, and a lot of them are free that you can download and um, use for your own purposes. It's actually a pretty cool app. I do use it sometimes. So then I have here some links to some really good videos on how to use Avenza and what's it all what it, what it's all about. So I am offering this option. It's totally optional. If you don't want to use it, that's totally fine. Um, but uh, I just wanted to let everyone know because this will be in the email as well. But I wanted to show you that. And this is what the icon looks like from the um, those app stores for your phone. It's this little sort of mountain and little sunrise going on. So Avenza is there for your uses. Okay. So um, we got the, I think we sort of covered all the basic logistics of the Wachukas survey coming up this Saturday and the Chiricahua survey coming up this Sunday. Um, yeah. So Wachukas on Saturday, Chiricahua's on Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen and I'm actually going to stop. Well, let me look at this chat real quick. Okay. Um, thank you, Rob. That's a really good comment. So, um, all right. So here's some good info from people. Thank you. So let me see if I can expand this. All right. So, um, I have visitors, uh, but the visitor's gate isn't open until 8 a.m. on the weekends. The visitor's gate, but you can go through the van demand gate, I think 24 hours, right? And I think Robert says that. Yep. The van demand gate is open 24 7, accessible from Highway 90 bypass intersection. So, yes. So, if you're not too familiar with Sierra Vista, there's sort of the main gate that people will often refer to, and that's where Fry Boulevard intersects with Buffalo Soldier Trail. So that gate looks like it has some restrictions on when you can enter 8 a.m. The gate that's further north, the one where um, the 90 bypass intersects with sort of the beginning of the northern end of Buffalo Soldier Trail, kind of like that most, the, not the most, northern, but the, the gate that's more northern called the Van Deman Gate, that one's 24-7. And that's actually where the, the facility is to get a pass as well. Uh, this is for Fort Huachuca and the Huachuca Mountain Survey. If you go down the Van Demand Gate, you know, turn in towards the fort, and right before you get to the the place where there's guys who want to check your pass, right before that, you'll see a parking lot on the right, and there's a um, sort of portable building there, and that's where you're going to go in. You're going to park before you get to the the actual gate itself. That's where you go in, fill out the paperwork, get a pass. And then you use that pass to continue in. So, and I have a link too that I'm going to share with everyone with information from the fort about how to get a pass and what that entails. I see a question. Yes, Christina. 
Hey, I just wanted to say, Jenny, um, the fort changed a couple months ago. <laughs> there, you can no longer really get a pass 24 seven. Okay. Um, they say you can, but you really can't. Um, they've denied me a pass. It opens at 5.30 in the morning on weekdays and 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday and Sunday. That's the so facility I would strongly to get a pass. recommend if you need a pass, yeah. you can no longer really get it 24 7. Okay. You used to be able to. Yeah, yeah. So, so I would highly recommend if you're going to go on the fort that you secure a pass before the survey date. Okay. It's Thank you. That's very good. That's very yeah, good it, to know. It, it surprised me because I was down there a couple weeks ago and I forgot my pass. So I went to get one reissued and they said, no, we're too busy. You have to wait till the gate opens at 530 in the morning, the main gate, the van to man gate. So okay. they have changed their policy. Okay. Thank you. That's very good to know. Um, thank you. I think we, that's really good. So that's good information for everybody who does get assigned to the fort or wants, just wants to go birding on the fort. Uh, I have a pass that's still valid through August, but, um, and, and that's great how they give them to you. Once you go through the trouble of getting it, it's uh, good for up to a year, which is nice. Now, if you are a retired member of the military or something and have a military pass, that should also work to get you in. But, um, so I also have a question here. Can you send a link to recommended GPS apps? Yes, I will a link to everybody. My, um, sort of a page I've written up about how to use GPS in the field. But one I particularly like is one called GPS status. And it's, it's got this little, it's got this little um, function where it shows a little compass and it has your, it plays your coordinates for you. And it sort of just displays your coordinates. It does, it's a free app and it doesn't save them necessarily, but it lets you sort of, it shows them, you can just jot them down. I also, and I have other recommendations I've gotten from participants over the years of good apps that I have in that little shared, the document I'm going to share, a little write-up I have of how to use GPS in the field. Now, someone asked if you could use iNaturalist, and that is a really good idea. So if you take a photo of where you're like, oh, there's a trail around in the tree, or this is where I am, and you take a photo or you use iNaturalist, that will also save coordinates of your exact location but you have to do it pretty close like any gps feature you'd have to do it close to where you're getting trogons and so yeah any way that you can get coordinates whether i prefer either utms or the standard decimal degrees either is fine uh if you do some other format if it's if you can only figure out how to do like lat long with hours minutes seconds that's also fine just record that we can convert them but um be more and more standard for these apps is decimal degrees. That's what Google Maps tends to use. And I do think Robert commented, just push, press and hold on your location on a map, like on a Google map or something or Apple map or something. If you press and hold and make a pin that will also display coordinates and decimal degrees is the one a lot of these maps are using. But if your app is showing UTMs, that's also totally fine. Um, let's see if, if we talked about the gate, some really good information here about the fact that the van demand gate um, looks like starting November, starting this this winter will operate starting at 5 30 and then on the weekends 8 a.m will be closed federal holidays okay so it looks like we have some we'll have to get some information directly from the fort on that for for in the future but it looks like they may be doing some changes on that and maybe i'll just call the fort after the directly after this meeting and find out what's going on okay some really good information about the gate here which is great to get that from from locals um people in sierra vista all right. So, yep. So I have some people saying that um, the Buffalo Soldier Gate may not be open as much as the Van Demand Gate. I tend to just go in the Van Demand Gate now anyway. Um, okay. So I see Julie here has a question. Yeah, it's more of an observation. When um, my late husband and I first stumbled on this bird more than 30 years ago, um, one of the things that I noticed, and I haven't seen it mentioned, so maybe we were just, its movements were slow, more parrot-like in the head. Um, I'm not talking about when it flied, but when it was stationary, it was making the noise and we watched it and watched the behavior. And it just seemed to be different not flighty, not flitty. And has that been your experience? Is that a thing? Very much so. Yeah. So the, the trogons themselves are pretty, um, very, they, they, so the, the page from Cornell talked about that a little bit, they do this very still behavior and some of it just could be their beha their behavior. They, they also incorporate for hunting, right? With the sort of ambush insects, but they, when they sit, when they get into the vegetation, they do stay very still. They're not fidgety. They're not moving around a lot. Like some birds do like smaller birds do. 
they can be very still. And that's part of the reason we do these surveys in May is that is when they tend to be most vocal, which really helps with detection on these birds. But yeah, when and when they do fly, they move pretty, pretty, they're very strong flyers. They move really quite well, but then it's be very quiet flying. So sometimes you'll hear them calling and then suddenly they're calling behind you. Like, guys, oh, that's the same bird. Because if you didn't see them fly, you don't really hear them fly through the through the canopy. So yeah, they're very, they can be very, very still when they're sitting there. And some observers talk about how they'll be still for a very long time. Like for minutes and minutes, they can just stay very still and maybe moving their heads a little bit, but staying quite still, which really can make it uh, a little tricky to spot them up in the trees for sure. Okay. Yeah, the motions were just seemed to be slow motion, more like because we used to have parrots and they yeah. sort of moved their head and rotated it more parrot like as opposed to like, that's why it was just interesting. And just that's one thing we noticed. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a very good observation. And that's that's a really good sort of clue into their behavior. All right, so I have a large info email that I'm going to be sending out to everybody with with links talking about this event. So I have a one, a general one about how to use GPS and some recommended GPS apps, which is a really good way to just sort of get the coordinates of where you're standing at this moment, hearing a trogon and put it, you know, right, recording it. And then I have uh, all the information about this new option of Avenza. And if, if you're, it's totally optional. I just wanted to make sure people had another option if they wanted it to do an offline map. And, um, and then some specific information about the surveys, as well as the link to the document when it's ready with the, um, teams and what routes people are assigned to. So that'll all be going out today. And that gives us a few days too. If, if you need to give me any sort of like, oh, I need to move or something's happened, gives us a few days to sort it all out. Okay. So I have a question here about uh, camping for free in the Chiricahuas. No, that is no longer an option. The Coronado uh, does not want to do that. And so if you are camping in the Chiricahuas, if you hang on to that receipt, you know, like the, the pay stub and you submit that to me, I can go ahead and get you reimbursed for that. But um, dispersed camping is always free. But if you're camping in the campgrounds, I can't remember what the price is now. I don't know if it's 10 or 20 bucks, but I think they raised it. But yeah, just hang on to that stub and uh, get that to me and I can get you reimbursed for that if you would like. But yeah, the Coronado is no longer um, offering free camping. And a lot of it has to do with the fact the survey happens on Memorial Day weekend. So they're just not, not into that anymore. So that's a good question, but yep, that is not a thing anymore, but just go ahead and uh, Brian, just, just go ahead and just maybe even just, even just a, just text me later a photo of that stuff and I can take care of that for you. Okay. So uh, let's see here. I think, I think I addressed all the questions in the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording.